Okay, well, uh, Melissa, Verena, Randy, welcome. It's uh, great to be able to go over this presentation that sort of been delivered over the last couple of years for sure around British Columbia and, and did it in uh, Ontario and Niagara Falls and Fall and Randy, I think you were there at the conference as well. And uh, as well as it's been done down in uh, Key West with the Institute for Innovation Education with the University of Michigan. And that's a partnership we've been growing and Randy's involved with that as well. So the goal here is just to talk about, uh, you know, the Navigate programs uh, as they've unfolded over the last few years. And there's some new ones that aren't even included on the slideshow, the slide deck today that are unfolding as we speak. So the whole blended platform is expanding and it's expanding rapidly. And, you know, even just in the last meeting we had with secondary administrators in our own district, the whole, you know, they're starting to talk blended, the, the whole piece around uh, shifting the, the district practice from K to 12 is unfolding rapidly. And it's part of the themes of this, this presentation. So it's uh, an exciting time. I think it's very timely. So rather than go through, um, you know, a, an approach which doesn't speak uh, authentically, I thought I'd present the kind of things that we've been doing that might speak to you individually in your own work, uh, in your own jurisdiction. So hopefully uh, you'll take a lot away from it today. And as I said, Marika will join us shortly. So Navigate NIDES, uh, we were originally formed in about 1989 as one of the original nine DE schools in British Columbia. Uh, and they were very regional uh, schools. Uh, they're South Island Distance Education School. So Sides was in Saanich in, near Victoria. Uh, Nides was on the North Island. We had this uh, whole view of the world back then in the, in the early 1990s that the, the province would be carved up into um, just distance education jurisdictions. And that's changed so rapidly. Um, so you know, we're about the fifth largest DL school in BC now. Uh, there are a total of 55 uh, DL schools in BC that are public and about 15 that are independent. Um, we are one of those DL schools in British Columbia that have a provincial scale. Uh, many of the DL schools, of the 55 public at least, are really focused on local clientele and not on um, a provincial scale. 60% of our students are outside of this district and that's a, an important piece for us because we really serve clients in, in all parts of British Columbia, K through 12. Uh, we have students uh, in 50 of 60 districts across BC uh, either taking a course or being full-time with us. Our head counts about 4,000 plus and, and we do, like I said, a whole raft of different programs for full and part-time students. So it's a very complex operation um, with many, many programs. And when I actually walk through uh, the board as I did last week, the complexity of our platforms, uh, they, their heads kind of spin. Um, but it's in a very unique time and we're, we've really been seen locally as a driver of innovation. And we're seeing that more and more with DL across BC that the hub of innovation in school districts is actually coming from the distributed learning field, not from the brick and mortar field, which is really an interesting and great place to be as an administrator and as an educator. So what's driving the change? I always talk about this, uh, this piece in the presentations is that social media, the internet, the mobility with which our children, um, our students are living their lives uh, is really coming into the school from the outside in. Uh, so it really isn't about uh, us driving change anymore. I think the students themselves, their families, the world around schools, around school environments are driving changes in ways we're not in control of anymore. Uh, that handheld phone uh, is really what is really what's driving change. Students want to be fully mobile. They want to learn and can learn any place, any time. And they have the technology now to do that. And they're doing it despite us. So either we uh, get on board uh, with that shift that's going on, uh, or we don't. And I'm not just talking about the distributed learning field. I'm talking about all education, all public education. So the change is really being driven externally, not internally. And that's, I think, uh, not too many educators really, I think, deeply understand that. They're getting it. Uh, but I don't think they truly deeply understand it. And that's 
that's uh, coming at them in ways uh, I think that they'll, they won't be able to duck and hide for very much longer if they don't get it. Yes, it's a rocket ship uh, more than a train. I agree. So change is good, but change isn't easy. Uh, it's very difficult, as we all know. Uh, I love this slide. It really talks to the, our journey. Uh, we decided four or five years back that we actually wanted to make the school current. I use the word the term sexy. Uh, a lot of people laugh and kind of cringe when I say that, but we wanted to leave the the, the, the sort of distance ed distributed learning um, nexus behind and do stuff that was really taking advantage of the, the freedom we had in the distributed learning world in BC uh, to to a different place and to create hybrid programs that really punched through a few uh, conventions that we were being really restricted in our thinking around. But with that change, it takes, it takes a lot of risk. I was very fortunate to have a superintendent at the time that saw that this was where things were going, was very forward thinking, and was willing to take some risks with me and sponsored the creation of some new uh, blended programs that broke the mold completely. Alongside of that came resources, some funding to help uh, the startup, and those were significant uh, resources, both in terms of uh, human resources and physical resources. But immediately when we started going down that train, that journey, we hit into some fairly fierce resistance, not only from my colleagues around the district, because what we were doing was so out of the box, uh, but also internally within the school, because the old DEDL old guard was really um, not too sure about where we were taking this, and they felt a bit threatened. Some of the families felt threatened that these new programs were taking over, the older programs were going to be left behind. And we had to constantly work on that resistance piece uh, through communication to try to uh, share that message of, of renewal rather than just staying the same. At the end, there were rewards, but the rewards really come with the way we've rebuilt community here and rebuilt learning from the ground up. And that's been our journey. Uh, and it's just, you know, everybody likes change, but uh, not everybody's game to take it on. And they want to see successes. They don't want to be the, the early adopters. They don't want to be the beta testers. Uh, but if you're really going to do the deep learning as a school community, as a school district, uh, and with our brick and mortar colleagues, we've got to dive into this change and go into the new pool. So um, that goldfish out of the water, is, uh, I've lived that every uh, step of the way, and I know Marika has as well. One of the very first programs we created uh, was uh, ENTER, the e Academy of New Technologies, Engineering and Robotics. That's now growing up to be E2 or ENTER2. Uh, so we have a grade six, seven platform and a grade eight, nine platform. And this year we're launching iMaker which is a mini school concept for grades nine, or rather grades 10 through 12. Um, following up on the ministry's coding announcements and the ADST curriculum, Applied Design Skills and Technology. Um, we're now going into our fifth year. Um, it's really not been a huge program. It's, Enter is not a huge program. It's designed originally for 24 students, and we're looking at doubling that this year. But it was for those students that really had that real desire to focus on engineering technology, the STEM curriculum, uh, and the kind of the kids that just don't survive in the regular classroom because they're kind of the geeks, they're the techmeisters who uh, really thrive in that, that's their language, that's their world, uh, but they don't find that in their regular classroom. Um, so ENTER is really our first, was one of our first ventures into that blended programming. We were really lucky that first year uh, to land an amazing teacher, Roger Vernon, who was a trades-trained um, uh, teacher, so the old school, so, uh, you know, construction, design, jo carpentry, joinery type guy, uh, but also he was young, um, really versed in technology, uh, and so he became this, the first Enter teacher uh, and has now moved on up into the Enter 2 program, but he really uh, worked closely with Marika that first year and we launched Enter. Uh, and it was a, you know, three days face-to-face -face platform, unheard of. You know, who's doing three days face-to-face -face with two days VL? It's usually you have, you know, full-on distributed learning students with maybe one day of interaction or a drop-in tutorial day, but the idea of doing a three-day face-to-face program with two days of distributed learning on the side was just not done. Uh, it was just too weird, and 
not uh, too far of a distance down the road from distributed learning and too close to the blended or too close to the face-to-face -face standard brick and mortar. Um, you know, and it's really, yeah, you're exactly right. We're moving from this DL world to blended and flexible learning platforms that uh, we lose the distinction between what is DL and brick and mortar. Absolutely. So that was the, the, the platform, and this was the program that was nominated for the INACOL Award and received the INACOL Award. Uh, it really reinforced us that what we were doing was world class, that it was really on the cutting edge and was really um, meeting the needs of students and families. The kids in this program are absolutely on fire for their learning. Um, we've had many videos developed about it, but they speak authentically and from the heart about what it's done to transform their, their journey in learning. And these are students that are now fighting to get to school, that want to get there, that are totally engaged, they're self-directed learners. They are fully uh, on board uh, with the learning and their families are. And it's really uh, a, a neat journey that we've gone down. You can even see I'm a consumer of my own product. My, my son is the second in on the left there uh, with his mouth trying to eat the spaghetti. Uh, so I'm a consumer of the product and he's thriving in this program as well. So what is the learning platform all about? It, in our journey, the, the whole platform is based, first and foremost, foremost, about basing student learning on student passions. We know from the work uh, of the Search Institute in Wisconsin and the extensive research they've done on asset-based learning that students thrive most when their learning is absolutely based in what they are passionate about. That might be engineering or robotics. It might be the performing arts. It might be I'm a physics geek. It might be that I love the planet and I want to be an environmental steward. Uh, you know, it might be that I'm empathic and I love working with, with other people and I see myself in that kind of counseling role uh, or that community stewardship role. When we base our programs on student passions, everything else falls into place. And I mean everything. The core academics, the, the, the behavioral issues in the classroom, uh, the, the cell, social emotional learning. Um, because they create a community of students that really think and learn and talk the same talk, they find their peaks in these programs and they go on this journey together. We found that that whole social emotional piece has become such a rich part of these programs uh, where these students really have a sense of belonging and community because they're immersed in things they love to do. And literacy is taught through the things they love, whether it's math literacy or uh, language literacy, it all comes through that. We started right away with a curriculum integration uh, base uh, and project-based learning, and that has followed through very richly in all of the programs we oper operate, and taking students on that journey from, uh, you know, a prescribed, uh, pre-written curriculum to one that is much more exploratory and flexible uh, has been a journey for Roger and now Mako and all of us in, in all of our programs about how to facilitate those uh, that diversity well, and it's a real so, tight approach to curriculum. So just just I want to jump in with a question here, Jeff, just for the folks as well. Um, how does that community expand into the online environment for the students? Is there any of that online community exchange or places or spaces that you've created as part of that? Yeah, for sure, Randy. We, the, the teachers use blogs to communicate uh, and to frame uh, the projects so that the students know and the parents know all the time what's being expected in the classroom. They, they uh, hold collaborate sessions on Mondays and Fridays in the morning and enter. So the students check in, talk about their day, talk about their learning, and then they do their math or their, their language arts uh, online and they complete a lot of the curriculum at home. So they create that online space as well. Um, they peer assess their projects uh, through the blogs and through e-portfolios, those kind of uh, technologies. So it really is a blended uh, version of both the face-to-face -face and the online uh, that really has created this marvelous learning opportunity. And, and the online piece really is about the self-directed um, learning. The students are taking their own pace in their math programs and their language arts programs, uh, their core curriculum. So the students are at all different places uh, in the online component, and they, the parents, uh, speak at length about the, the the brilliance of that. That they they can accelerate math or they can slow down. Uh, they can accelerate in their language arts or slow down. They can go to the next grade level when they finish the curriculum, and all of that's facilitated online and documented online. 
And I'll ask this question as well. Uh, how is this like flipped learning? Is it like that? Or is well, it different? There is some components of it that are flipped classroom where they they have projects they work on outside of the face to face time and then bring their findings in and bring their projects in. Um, but that's only one of the strategies that the teachers are using in terms of being a flipped classroom. It's they use pieces of they use that approach occasionally, but it's not a mainstay. I think there's this, this uh, it's very much interwoven. It's, it's uh, very seamless in many regards. They, they have the projects that they work on during the three days face to face that carry into the two days at home, but they also work independently at home on their own, their own uh, core academic learning. And it's a bit seamless, it weaves in and out of the classroom. Marika's here, by the way, now, if you want to say hi, Marika. Hi, everyone. Hey, how you doing, Marika? I'm good, thanks. We got all the lightweights in uh, the DL world. I see. Hi, Michael. Good to see you on the board as well. And Joe, um, good to have the uh, entire community out there. So, bending and breaking conventions, and I know uh, Marika can speak to this as well. I think when we look at uh, we look at what we're doing here, it is absolutely a conversation of breaking the conventions. Uh, what is known and what is acceptable in the educational world. In BC, we've been given a license to change. Some educational communities have grasped that and have jumped on board in a, in a really deep way with uh, that permission, uh, and some are still very conservative. But um, I think what this whole, this whole uh, conversation really comes back to is, um, you know, trying to create educational opportunities for students that radically shift uh, the conversation in a different direction and breaking conventions is never easy. I don't know about your feelings about that, Marika, in terms of where our own journey, but uh, we've certainly taken on a lot of the conventions and the things we thought were tried and true uh, aren't anymore and we're discovering new things all the time that are uh, becoming more of our, our core truth about what learning should be about. And I think it keeps shifting too. I think the fact that we um, we are able to try new things um, and have them sometimes not work and then go back and retry them and fix them uh, and keep moving forward. So even just having that permission to um, to break out of the out of the box, I guess, so to speak. It's been really interesting to listen to the, the conversation at the teacher level and enter with both Mako and Roger uh, and in our fine arts program too. Uh, they talk about failing faster. That's their conversation and failing smarter uh, and we did a, a, a an art exhibit um, this year uh, at one of the local uh, art galleries um, that was um, what was it called something alter repeat alter, make alter, make, alter, make, alter repeat, yeah. alter. make repeat alter it was all about that failing faster um, philosophy that's really gone right down to the student level and teacher level about breaking the conventions uh, about the things we do um, how did the Teachers Association respond to the program changes? Well, there was definitely uh, there was definitely a, a whiplash. Uh, there was questions about platform and legitimacy and how we do this, that, and other thing, and how we we choose teachers, how we support teachers through this. All of that came out, and we had to work through them uh, one issue at a time. But these programs were very unique. Uh, they took a very uh, no, mostly local. Uh, it was a local response, Randy. Um, you know, it was because it was so new and so out of the box, um, you know, finding the right teachers and putting the right teachers in place and then defending the teacher placements has always been an interesting place. But not nothing that the system can't handle. It just took uh, a, a lot of communication, a lot of working through some challenges. Yeah. No, yeah. I was just going to say, I think a lot of it's just a fear of the, of the unknown and um, the fact that we were doing things differently and maybe even a fear of that being brought into um, into their own school and their own program. New is not good in some people's view and it really threatens them and so there is definitely been some whiplash. And some of it has been overt, like it's come through the union, some of it's just in the community where they talk for the, you know, we've heard people, you know, kind of bad out the programs in some way, shape or form because it's new, it's challenging and it's, uh, it's just, you know, really trying to communicate and use, you know, all the forms that are, uh, all the forms of communication in the community to sort of keep, um, sharing the successes of the program and the, and the stories. 
Uh, we're funded as a DL program. He's, uh, actually, our our FAE and ENER programs are funded as regular programs because they're over uh, 50%. In BC, anything over 50% is eligible for brick and mortar funding. We provide them in a, we base them in a DL model, but fund them in, in a brick and mortar uh, funding um, uh, mechanism because they're over 50%. And we're able to do that. We've worked that out with the ministry. So, good question, uh, Joe. So this is what risk taking is in education, and I always go back to this as a, a great quote uh, from How I Met Your Mother, and of course uh, Barney Stinson is the character. But um, we are so reticent to jump off, uh, jump out of the pool and into the new one because uh, a lot of what we see at district level, especially, is um, the facsimile of change, but not the substance of change. In other words, you see a lot of programs get uh, announced as the new best thing that's just going to shift the way we think as teachers, the way we the way we do business and education, it's promised, uh, you know, we're going to do it as a district level and everybody in the district is going to follow the suit, but it, in, it, in, in the substance of it, it it's, it's tantamount to no change at all. Uh, the real change is, is, is really much more risky and there's much more on the table and it's much more local, it's much more small scale. And if that's one message I could share with you, it's small changes that make a big ripple that are the most important. This is large scale, huge district wide uh, kind of phenomenon that we've all been exposed to, whether it's professional learning communities or you name it, uh, you know, effective behavior support. I remember that one being the one that was going to solve our problems in the classroom. Those ones are, they have promise and they do have impact, but they don't have sustaining change. Uh, it's, it's been the story of the deep changes that these programs that we created have had that are having a ripple far beyond. Uh, anything of those sort of macro level uh, platforms. So this, um, I'm sure you can all think of your own examples uh, in your own districts and your own jurisdictions about uh, the promise of big change not being delivered or realized because after two or three years it all fizzles out. Uh, whereas these programs I think have legs and, and the model is here to stay and I don't think it's going away. In fact, I had a big conversation this morning about creating some new ones and taking out some new programs provincially uh, in communities all over BC based on these models. What's the, um, the advantage for DL funding? Uh, Joe, it's really, uh, it's really just because of the difference in funding level. If we can get it funded as a brick and mortar program, uh, if the difference is, you know, about a thousand dollars a student. So when you're dealing with a hundred students in a program, it's a hundred thousand um, dollars. So that's the big change, the big difference in the funding piece. Those of you in the DL world know this phenomenon very clearly. Um, we're on the periphery of DL and um, you know the brick and mortar schools really don't like us and they don't understand us and they really don't want much to do with us. So in the beginning, you know, uh, at the start of all these changes, this is the, the dichotomy that we lived in. We were the smelly, 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 skunky kind of cousin that, that uh, everybody liked to sort of say was over there in that corner of the district. Nobody really knew what uh, was going on in it. Uh, they just knew it existed and there was, there was interesting teachers that ended up there and interesting students and interesting administrators. You kind of live that, uh, wow, whoo, you're on the outside, you're really on the periphery kind of uh, piece of the education and uh, it's now shifting towards the mainstream and in the, in the center of that. And again, that's, that's the way the dynamics have unfolded in British Columbia for um, both policy but also uh, external reasons to why this shift is taking place. So that BC DL context for those of you who live outside BC, uh, here's a, just a, sh a very brief synopsis of it. We're one of the most regulated uh, distributed learning environments in North America, uh, but it's also one of the fastest growing segments of the market, the, in the educational market that is. Um, that's both by design, um, the ministry has really wanted us to be unique and growing fast uh, and has really expanded the DL franchise over the last eight years. Uh, to the point now that they have to actually haul it back in or are looking at containing it because it's the fastest growing segment of our education market in BC. We have about 22,000 FTE all over the province if you boil it all down, which is the same size as uh, Richmond School District. So it's a, it's a full school district size of DL in BC. And a really interesting stat came out from the ministry the other day or last year about the grad rate and how DL affects it. So a student Students who take a DL course in their six-year graduation rate, um, their graduation rate is actually about 5% higher than the mainstream. 
So students who don't take a DL course of an 85.3% grad rate versus 89.9 in the year of 2013. That's a really interesting piece to keep us in mind um, because it really shapes our understanding about how important DL is in improving success and achievement in, in the province as part of an overall strategy. So we've all seen this as well, uh, the, the claim uh, put up by the Christensen Institute that by 2019, about 50% of all secondary school courses will be online. Now, that's the US context. That's driven by a very different uh, conversation in the United States about what blended is and isn't. Uh, the, the Canadian context, certainly the BC context, does not reflect the kind of cost pressure uh, justifications for going blended that we're that, that we're seeing. We we really our debate isn't about uh, using blended as a, as a more effective economic tool for education, but as a more more effective pedagogical platform, uh, which is really uh, shifting things. We've seen this start to take off, though. In reality, whether it's 50% or not, we're really seeing the shift in the demand for online learning is growing and it's growing rapidly. I don't know, Marika, what do you got to say about that in terms of where you're seeing things? Um, yeah, and I see, well, for me, because I work mostly with our K-7 um, folks, I definitely see an increase in requests um, at the elementary level for taking courses online, which um, has yeah, a significant increase, I would say, in the past year. Um, I get at least um, a phone call or an email a week from either a parent or a, a teacher or um, administrator in our district asking um, if a K-7 student can take a course with us online um, and, or, or be blended or cross-enrolled. So. One of the blended platforms that we instituted a few years back were independent learning centers in all three of our secondary schools that are they're staffed full-time by an experienced distributed learning teacher uh, who monitors the progress of the students taking online courses in a computer lab in each of the secondary schools. The demand for those uh, labs and the demand to get into the ILCs now is, is exceeding capacity. We now have more students that are choosing actively on the timetable requests each, each January, February to take more and more DL courses in the ILC to the point where they, they're being asked to double the size and staffing of the ILCs the completion rates are huge. They're up in the 80 percent, 85 percent in many of our courses. Uh, and the schools are really grappling with it because the brick and mortar regular teachers are losing uh, students to the ILCs. And you know, one of our secondary schools actually tried to go back to an old policy where there, if you offered the course in that block where the ILC was offered, you couldn't take it at the ILC. That had to be overturned uh, at the senior management level because they were going back to that. They were trying to. It's having such a uh, disruptive effect on the brick and mortar secondary schools that it's shifting them. So we're seeing evidence that this is really true. Whether it's 50% or not, it's, it's a, a landslide of change that is taking place in the fabric because students want this kind of learning. And for those that are good at it, they thrive in it, they want more of it. And like you say, some districts have uh, policies where everybody's got to do a course, whether it's planning 10 or a senior uh, core academic or Otherwise, it's, those are becoming more commonplace throughout BC. This slide is very familiar to people in BC as well. It's that, um, again, it goes back to that skunk slide. It's about that journey between being on the periphery to being mainstream. And we're finding that the shift at the ministry and at the local level is really just about learning in our secondary breakfast meeting the other day. We're talking, okay, um, the, one of the secondary principals who's always been in a brick and mortar said, okay, so how are we doing this blended thing? How is this new platform? going to affect us. And they're starting to have that conversation that it's not just about uh, distributed learning versus brick and mortar. It's really about just one platform for learning for all students. Um, yeah, DL is dead. You know, that the, the, the standalone world of DL, I think, is on its way out. I think we are going to be more and more part of the mainstream. So, um, yeah, you're right. He didn't mean that there's, there's always going to be demand for students to do courses online at a distance, but I think it's, we're going to be woven more and more into the mainstream rather than being on that periphery. So we might still be a little bit smelly like Pepe Le Pew, but a little bit less so, and the cat might actually be chasing us rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. Actually, Verena had a question okay. prior just about um, 
whether when we talked about um, secondary kids taking DL courses, do they really want do they really want it because they're good at it or because it is convenient to them? So I think it's both. I think sometimes it is convenient, sometimes they're not able to take the course they want, so they choose a DL course, but I think more and more kids um, that is the way they learn. They want to learn online. They want to um, have that freedom to learn uh, at their own pace, wherever they want, whenever they want, uh, using um, whatever device they want. So I think that's growing. I think maybe we started out with it being more um, a matter of convenience, um, but I think we're growing more towards it's really what they want to do. And I think as the capacity, in terms of instructional capacity and the expertise in the ILCs grows, those secondary students are really, once they've taken one, they want to take two and three and four. They can do their, they can do their courses in two to three months if they apply themselves. We've seen that happen over and over again. Rather than sit through a linear course all year long or a semester course that really drags in their mind. So for the students that are good at distributed learning and learning online, they love it and they just want to get her done. And that's the way what we're seeing happen. Uh, and it is creating a whole world of choice for students that's driving change. It's driving fundamental change in the way that teachers look at their jobs, and the way that students look at schools, and the way that parents view schools and education. The old conversation five years ago, or you're taking a knives course, we were the school of last resort. Now we're the school of first choice in many instances because the reputation of the distributed learning world has so elevated uh, they are seeing now that the students can achieve far faster with equal or better results in terms of their learning outcomes. And so we're seeing that whole shift unravel before our eyes in this district. And I think that's not just our district. I think that's throughout the province. I think it's a capacity thing that uh, online learning is uh, in many jurisdictions across BC is really um, starting to grow. And we're starting to see that shift in very tangible ways. Um, you know, it's really, I mean, when I talk about blended learning with different uh, audiences, I really try to get across this idea uh, of the four uh, components, the path, pace, uh, time, and, and place, and how blended learning, and also about how uh, broad the kind of modalities are in terms of delivering blended learning, whether it's doing online learning within a full-time uh, five-day face-to-face class, or just uh, partial face-to-face -face with almost a, a complete virtual component. Um, everything between those two extremes um, is possible. And we're just starting to toy with how to do that well and, and experience, in an experiential mode, what works best and what works best for specific clientele. Um, and so we're, I think, in this great journey in education around um, discovering what those modalities actually are and what they can look like and how they can be um, bent for every student individually and for cohorts of students uh, that are coming out. Uh, you know, so this is really an exciting time, I think, as we start to put more and more of our curriculum online and start to marry traditional instruction with, with, with online uh, learning, we're finding all sorts of different ways to mold it, and it's creating some real great opportunities for students. So our journey, I'm going to let um, Marika talk a little bit about our journey uh, initially about why we started to change because Marika was very much a part of our initial journey as a, as a teacher, then became a vice principal in the school. So um, maybe to talk a little bit about that, those first few years when we jumped into the, the blended learning back yeah. around 2012. And I was, a, I was actually a teacher at the time, so um, I think Jeff, you were part of the process of um, implementing our, our fee and entry programs and I was teaching, I was a teacher in our, um, in our DL program uh, with our one day a week uh, interaction day. Uh, I taught I was in Nanaimo one day a week and, and was here. Um, and as Jeff has listed, we were noticing um, a significant decline in our DL enrollment um, and we're finding that a lot of our well, a lot of our clientele were, were happy and that was exactly what they were looking for. Um, and we were receiving more and more inquiries around what else do you have? Is there, is there more? Uh, we don't watch five days a week, but one day isn't enough. And just uh, looking for sort of that middle, that middle ground piece. Um, 
Um, again, um, the competitive marketplace, uh, lots of other programs were popping up uh, that were offering different things. So in order for us to um, not only retain our students, but um, uh, increase our registration, um, we needed to think of something different. What else could we offer? What else could we offer our students? And I think that sort of led us into um, looking at uh, what we could bring in that was new, that was different, that was unique, and that would sort of fill that middle ground for people. Um, not five days, but, but more than one day a week face-to-face. -face. We need to make a big shift as a school. Um, we had really old school things happening. We were still doing partial school in a box, shipping it out, a lot of paper-based courses. Um, we knew there was a latent demand out there. They call us in uh, the Christensen Institute the uh, areas of non-consumption. We knew that there was a lot of that out there. Um, DL policy was shifting. The BC education plan was starting to be announced. There was a huge push for personal uh, learning and personalization project-based learning, inquiry-based learning. And as I've already mentioned, we had a large amount of support from the district office for innovation. And so it created a real environment where we needed to really transform the entire school and the district uh, through the school. So the first steps we went through was rebranding the school. We went from Knives to Navigate. Uh, we still hold on to the legal title of North Island Distance Education School, but that was geocentric and it was old DE thinking. Um, we needed to make it current. You know, we've seen other schools go through that journey. Um, Surrey Connect is now SAIL, the Surrey Academy of uh, Innovative Learning. Uh, we're Navigate. We hired a, a marketing firm, a local marketing company, to help us go through that rebranding exercise. Uh, who does that? You know, as a brick and mortar principal, who would have thought of that? Uh, but, you know, we have a budget every year in the tens of thousands of dollars for marketing now, and they helped us go through a remarketing or rebranding ourselves and creating a new website which was up to date and dynamic and uh, we just needed to really reinvent the school. And you're right, there's no longer a, a, um, a monopoly type situation where you control a certain region which was the original DE concept in British Columbia. It's a free market economy in terms of uh, learning and choice now. Uh, across BC, and we're still having those conversations in depth. The other thing we did was created a learning philosophy that was based on these four books, and we really went to great lengths to communicate it out, not only to our teachers, but to our parent community and in the design of the programs. So I'm not going to go through these individually because it'll take too much time, but those were the four books that really at the time were seminal in reshaping our approach to 21st century learning, personalized learning, and the, and the programs that were really about, they, they, they speak to sparks, they speak to uh, asset-based focus for students versus a deficit-based approach. Uh, we want to create environments where students found and worked on their understanding of flow and being in depth in the moment and not breaking that apart and giving the children a chance to experience that not only individually but as a group and try to experiment with that. It now looks like this, so the conversation is moving along. Uh, I really like Tony Wagner's uh, focus on, you know, it's simplistic, but it's also very complex when you get into the details of making it happen, but that schools are about play in the early years. Secondary schools are about building passion as well as post-secondary, the undergraduate years, are about just uh, helping students find their passion in life. And really beyond that, it's about finding your moral purpose or your purpose in life. Uh, so that play, passion, purpose approach that you see in Tony Wagner's work is really a, a, a beautiful way of summarizing the way we look at it now. Now step three was creating all these programs and they all came up within about a year or two. So Enter was created, the Fine Arts Academy was created the first the same year. We created the Matrix which was a program where you could be a full-time Navigate student in one of our local secondary schools, could access the face-to-face -face electives at that secondary school but you did your core academics online with us. We created the secondary ILCs we created a new full-time uh, secondary I class program for uh, a group of our students that weren't really being serviced at all and called it I class for our secondary. So they met one day a week. We also created a, a blended a program called the Patch, which trained students uh, from the mainstream schools in all the certifications they need to go up to work in the oil patch. At that time, there was still a, a, a large number of students leaving with before graduating that didn't have the certifications. Um, 
you know, and that's a, uh, and that really, uh, that really started to, to blossom. We all went up and whole hog and creating these blended opportunities. Aboriginal perspective, a uh, really good question, Joe. Um, we found the FAY program in particular, we've uh, taken Martin Brokenleg's Circle of Courage and actually used it as the template for our assessment platform overall. And the teachers have done a great job, and the done a great job of reshaping um, that Circle of Courage into their assessment platform. Um, we created it with the support of the district uh, in terms of all these programs. And it was really one year, it all started in 2012. The independent learning centers, you know, I've talk, talked about those. It's, it's, a face, it's a teacher face on either side of the computer. Uh, it was a big investment for the school district. Um, they made the commitment to make them happen. They gave the secondary schools the staffing and made sure that they had a full-time ILC teacher. And as we've seen, the capacity of those ILC teachers as well as our system, our school systems in, in supporting students on the other side of the screen has increased dramatically. And it's led to very high completion rates and increasing demand for online learning in our district. It's really been transformative. No single innovation, as simple as this one was, um, no single innovation I think that we've done has been as transformative as ILCs. Uh, when it's staffed by highly competent DL teachers, and when you have a teacher on this side of the screen who's teaching the course in coordination with an ILC teacher where there's good communication, it just really makes a huge difference in the outcomes. Secondary I class, um, just really it was an experiment to begin with and has now grown to a very rich community in, in uh, not only in the Comox Valley, but in, in Nanaimo where we have operations and in Qualicum Beach. Uh, one of the outcomes of that uh, secondary I, I class was again this passion piece. We had a lot of students that had an interest in robotics and one of our teachers you see there, Stu Savard, who was kind of the, the godfather of the ENTER program. Um, brought Dex Robotics to our secondary students and within about 14, 15 months they went from knowing nothing about Dex to being um, uh, representing BC at the World Championships in San Diego. So you just never know where that passion piece is going to drive. But here's the team in San Diego competing at the Worlds. I think they came about 34th, 24th, uh, 23rd out of some 400, over 400 teams. A remarkable result when you actually put the right uh, teacher in front of the right students in the right platform. It just, you never know where it's going to lead. Now we have about 11 or 12 VEX robotics teams that are gone from being sort of the backwater of VEX pool to the, the you know, provincial heavyweight uh, in, the, in the VEX uh, world. And Stu continues to lead that along with another one of our teachers, um, John Gare. And Roger Vernon of the Enter program has taken a team from Highland to Worlds this year. So it's affecting our secondary schools as well. The matrix I've described, it's really a portal for our, our, our secondary full-time students to access face-to-face -face electives, and that's working out well. Not huge numbers, but really worthwhile for those students that need that platform. The academies came out, um, and you know, we wanted to take advantage of the, the, the great things that DL offered in these new academies, these blended three-day face-to-face, two-day DL programs, personal education plans for every student. We want to really build rich parent involvement in the programs. We have a learning, learning cycles ca um, calendar, which allows the students to do project-based learning for eight to ten weeks. They have a compass week where they meet with the teachers again, and the students don't attend, but the students attend uh, community um, uh, workshops provided by community educators. We do e-portfolios and blogs uh, with all the academies. It's a very rich uh, parent community and rich in uh, online communication and assessment. I'm going to get uh, Marika to walk you through the Learning Cycles calendar because it really takes um, a good understanding of how that works because it really has become a centerpiece for ENTER and the Fine Arts Academy. Mm -hmm. So both of our ENTER and our Fine Arts uh, Academy programs follow um, the Learning Cycles calendar. Um, and it, it is fairly unique. Um, we always get lots of questions around it when we first start, but once um, our families um, start moving through the year, uh, they really value the way that we set it up. So our first week 
the first traditional first week of school, um, our students don't attend face to face. Um, all of our teachers hold uh, spark interviews, so they have hour long conversations with the student, the parent, the teacher, and also if uh, the student has a community champion or somebody who is an integral part of their learning process, could be a grandparent, uh, an aunt, an uncle, an older sibling, um, they bring those in as well. And it's really a time for um, the teacher to get to know the whole student. So the student um, with their parent, with their community champion, who are they, what are their sparks, what do they love to do, what are their hopes for the year, all those, all those types of things. And it's a, it's a good chunk of time to spend with them and really get to know each other. Um, we follow that with our learning cycles, which are now eight weeks long, uh, or ten weeks long, sorry. Um, and the learning cycle, at the end of the learning cycle, um, we culminate that with a compass week. And during the compass week, um, the teachers once again hold their spark interviews um, with the student parent um, and community champion, if uh, they should be part of that as well. Uh, students don't attend face-to-face. -face. Instead, we schedule during those face-to-face -face days, we schedule a variety of community activities. And these are activities that we hold either inside of our building um, or we hold out in the community. So they could be arts workshops. Um, we've had mountain biking, rock climbing, sewing, swimming, pottery, uh, cooking, gardening, um, so pretty much anything you can think of. And students uh, sign up for these activities uh, throughout the week and then also attend their SPARC interview. Um, the final week of the learning cycle, we also um, have a showcase that sort of showcases um, all of the learning that has been done through that learning cycle. Uh, so there's usually singing, there's dancing, there's music, and also all of the visual, digital, uh, dramatic arts that have been, uh, that they've done, that they participated in during that time, um, heading into the Compass Week. And then um, at the end of the year, uh, we have a celebration week, the final week of the year is a celebration week for the students and parents. Um, to come together, we usually have a big community picnic um, and really sort of wrap up that year and bring some closure to everyone for it. It's really been a transformative uh, experience trying to refine this over the last five years. What we started it with in 2012 has is, is really been, many things have been consistent, but many things have changed. I think district-wide we're hearing interest in the Spark Interview Week uh, as a way to start off the school year. And what is even more profound is the idea of personal education plans for every student, which is also a provincial conversation in British Columbia. And it's really this whole calendar, this learning cycles calendar, has been designed from the ground up to foster project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, and curriculum integration, uh, really meeting the needs of, of personalized education learning plans for every child. And we're seeing that that's really coming uh, to fruition and, and creating some marvelous learning opportunities for students and for families. So we're really excited about the way this works every year. It's a lot of work. Putting together those Compass Weeks is, is a massive amount of work uh, for the for, for Marika often and, and for any teacher that helps us out with it. Uh, but it's a really, um, you know, neat platform that we've, we continue to refine, but it's very effective for our community. The Fine Arts Academy was based, uh, started with uh, multi-grade classrooms at the heart. So we have K to two, three to five, six to eight. They're family groups where they have spark electives where the students do, uh, from kindergarten grade are in uh, the same classroom doing an elective, a uh, spark elective. Um, it's all about curriculum integration. And we started out with the four pillars of learning originally, and then that was transformed into Martin Broken Legs uh, Circle of Courage. Um, so that's the fine arts program. We've talked a lot about it already. Enter, we've talked a lot about it. The thing, the key thing with Enter is that we had a host school where they really wanted the program uh, and that they've really tried to integrate it and make it part of the school. I asked in elementary where the Enter program is. The principal there, Charles Schilling, is really behind the program. And we've been able to embed a, a blended learning model in his school that's fully part of what his school's identity has become. Um, so, you know, that's uh, a really big piece. And now, of course, Enter 2 is at Highland Secondary, and it's really transforming that school. And now with iMaker, the grade 10 to 12 iteration of Enter, 
it's like it's changing it even more deeply. And we have a question. A question. Connection to the inquiry hub. Yeah, there's some degree of conversation between David Trust and Inquiry Hub. Uh, we haven't had a lot of conversation. We were we were working we're working to launch a program here called Think Space, which is really similar to what the Inquiry Hub is about, but it's different in its approach. Uh, but there has been some cross pollinization, if you want, for lack of a better word, between what ideas. You know, Stephen Whiffen, when they were first creating the uh, Inquiry Hub uh, back in 2012. Uh, you know, answer it all came out of the same year. Uh, it seems to be a real pivotal point, 2012. Um, and yes, David uh, Truss and I talk constantly about blended learning platforms uh, and what I, where Inquiry Hub is. And there's about 50, 50, 60 students in Inquiry Hub now, very similar in scale to uh, to the Enter program. Uh, Faye is about 120 students, and there's a huge pressure to grow, particularly at the primary level for for the Fine Arts Academy. So what we've discovered to wrap up, we're getting towards the end of our, our, our hour here. Um, I'll start with the first uh, bullet. Um, when you design programs that are based and, and created out of areas of student passion, uh, you can't lose. Engagement goes right through the roof. Parent satisfaction goes through the roof. And as a result, student performance and achievement go through the roof. Um, whether you measure that in in actual uh, assessment or in student uh, in anecdotal evidence, observational evidence of student engagement in the classroom and their learning and the power of their control uh, over learning. Parents continually tell us that they've seen a huge transformation in their children where they've gone from being a dependent learner to being an independent learner and taking control not only of their academic learning but their social emotional learning as well. They're growing up in these programs in ways that we never thought possible. And we underestimated the power of these platforms to do just that, address social emotional learning. When these children are surrounded with kids that have the same passions and the teacher who's passionate about the same thing, magic happens. And it happens in the realm of social emotional learning. Rick is going to talk in the next couple of bullets. Okay. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I was just going to check my. Anyway, okay, parents want to be partners. So we have a very um, a very strong parent community um, in all of our programs, both our, our DL I-Class programs, our FAE Fine Arts program and ENTER programs. Um, and these parents really do. They want to be partners. They want to be part of their children's education. They want to be part of the decision-making at the school as much as as we can let them be that. Um, we have um, a strong uh, PAC executive um, with members representing each of our programs, which has been really great um, because they, they can speak to each of the programs that we have and bring forward um, anything that, that those programs are looking for, any ideas that they have. Um, our parents are always present in the school. Um, we have an early morning drop-off uh, every morning here for our DL, our I-Class program and our FAID program. And uh, every morning that I walk into the gym, um, there's always six, seven, eight, ten parents that are having coffee, chatting. Uh, they come into the office. They know all of the office staff. They know Jeff and I. Uh, they're comfortable coming in with their ideas. Um, so they, they really are, and I think they really value um, that we see them as partners and as co-facilitators. Um, all of our classrooms have open doors, and there are always parents coming in and out. Um, and I think that's something, uh, when I talk to families, and if we ask them what one of the things are that they really value about the school, it's that ability to uh, be a part of their child's education and to be a voice uh, in the school. And that's such a huge thing for, uh, I think, public education in general, general to start to understand about that whole piece of the parent involvement in learning. So often and for so long, we've kept parents at an arm's length uh, from our schools. They get to fundraise for us and they get to drive for us, but they don't get to actually be uh, part of the learning sequence and, and with deep involvement. And I think we've really uh, turned the tide on that and shown that that's false. Parents want to be very intimately involved in their child's education and in the life of the school, not just for their own child. A few other lessons. Um, 
begin with a, a clear and viable philosophy. Um, really think carefully about the, the philosophy, the pedagogy that you want to drive through the program. Be flexible enough to let the teachers uh, take that philosophy and create uh, a real breathing, living example of what that can be. But give them a, a clear starting point. Uh, don't waver on that and stick to it. Um, they may debate about the actual uh, iterance of it, how it looks as an actual fact, and they may, but it's that constantly failing but refining approach that, that they, once they get a handle on that and they're given the license to create and change it, it's powerful. I've also, yeah, Marika? So I was going to say, and providing them with that support, I think letting them know that they have the ability to to move forward and try things and fail and, and change and being there to support them and it's sort of that shared leadership piece where um, where you're there to facilitate the ideas and, and work together to move the program forward. Yeah, I think uh, the other thing is build it and they will come. So much we, we waver and we, we stutter and we, um, you know, perseverate on what we should actually do for change in schools. My experience, and I think our experience as a school is that if you build it, they'll come. If you create programs uh, that are based on those student pla pla uh, passions, um, there's a huge latent demand out there in the community for change. Parents are hungry for it, students are hungry. When it's well articul articulated and supported by a clear mandate from the board office, they jump on board. The other next piece is run the experiment. Um, I always refer to it as fire ready aim. You don't always know where you're going to end up, but you need to go. And you need to adjust while the bullet's in flight, so to speak. So that's why I say fire ready aim. You know, you've got to jump out of the gates. You've got to do it. You've got to adjust in flight, and you've got to aim yourself as you move. Um, but you've got to stick with the experiment. And things, we always said that these programs would reach maturity about five years out, and we're truly realizing that now. Thoughts on that, Marika? No, I think you're right. I just think back to um, when we first started the ENTRE program, and it was Roger and myself, we were the two teachers uh, piloting it, and we spent the entire summer um, getting ready, planning, having everything in place, um, and then the kids came in the first day, and we just looked at each other, and, and everything we done sort of went into the garbage, and we had to start over again. Um, we could have thrown up our hands and said, okay, this isn't going to work. This is a totally different group of kids than we expected. None of our plans are going to work. Um, but we, um, you know, we moved forward. We looked at what we had and recognized that um, we needed to change. It, it was a different type of learning. We had a different type of student here, um, and we needed to move forward with that. And, um, and I think we've come a long way since then. Yeah. yeah. Totally. It's, it's the whole school, the whole thinking around what is innovation, what's possible has totally been liberated, I think, over the last five years. And that last message there about communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, you just can't do enough of that. You need to constantly get the message out into the community, into the parent of sphere, uh, and the senior administration. Use every tool you can to communicate the successes and the substance of the change. And be there, uh, Johnny on the spot, so to speak, with your colleagues in brick and mortar schools that may have questions or raise interest. We've had a huge increase in interest in becoming uh, blended teachers in our secondary schools, and that's now starting to reverberate in our elementary schools. The more we communicate, the more we support, the more we reach out or respond quickly to um, pockets of interest, the, the, we've just found the interest accelerating greatly over the last few years. And finally, that last thing I, we started with was don't think big, think small. Um, you know, small changes tilt the axis far more important, far more deeper ways than macro level, big picture type changes. I find that when you have successful micro programs uh, that speak to the power of personalization and, and bending conventions, you have a, a recipe for supporting uh, um, enterprise level change in a way you don't when you start at the enterprise level. Uh, so that's our message is really start, think small, create examples that are powerful and communicate that out and you start to see system wide change happening because of it and not the other way around, which is all too often the model in education. So that's our time.
that's our message. Um, it's about just, like I said, running the experiment. Wow. Incredible. Thank you both for sharing. Um, passionate, excited, engaging. Um, I like what you're doing um, and how it fits. And I think that I can certainly see why I make all, uh, and the awards were, were won. I think there's a message that I want to make sure it does go out across uh, and loud and wide. So this recording, the information you've shared, but more importantly as well, we'll we're going to do a, a member spotlight on what Navigate has done uh, as well and put consolidate uh, that information for consuming in a slightly different way as well. And I know that uh, with Michael Barber, we also have, are going to make this part of a feature for the Candy Learning Fair, the Nation Research. So on behalf of the smaller group, but certainly engaged group, I want to thank you. This is terrific. Uh, very much appreciated. Any comments, questions from the crowd here? And, I'm really excited. Well, I was wondering about the feedback that you've got from your district so far and for next year. Um, like knowing both of you and the changes that you've gone through, are you starting to see the momentum and the changes, not just from the parents and the students, but from your own educators and, and district? And what does that look like? Um, I think we're we're definitely seeing momentum. Um, as Jeff said, we're if I think about our teachers who are starting to uh, contact us and, and um, ask about um, blended programs and how might they turn their brick and mortar class into a, a blended course or uh, what we could suggest they take to become uh, a blended teacher or an online teacher. I definitely see momentum there and I think just being out in the community, um, being at meetings, whether it's with parents or other administrators or teachers um, and just the response and the questions people have um, have definitely become more positive over the years. Um, and they've seen us out there, they hear what we're doing, and um, so that, that feedback has become increasingly uh, positive. Um, and I think from parents, when I think about parents in the district, um, it's the, you know, 20 plus messages on my phone I walk into on an almost daily basis from inquiries about our program, um, that definitely tells me that that we're out there and, um, and people are interested. The only other obvious thing I would add to what Marika said is I know at the district level it's now a, it's a containment piece because it's becoming, the programs are becoming so popular and the subscription for the programs is exceeding their ability to actually staff them because what's happening is we're taking students from all over the district and not only just from the public system, but from the independent system and from students are actually, parents are moving to the community to attend these programs. And the, the challenge for our senior administration and trustees is actually staffing them now because demand is, they're, 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 you know, they're, they want to double in size these programs very quickly. They're happy problems. Yeah. I like that, happy problems. <laughs> Yeah, terrific. Uh, thanks, folks. And uh, I see Melissa might be texting something here. She's in on a mobile. Maybe not. All good. Okay, hey, thanks. What I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll just say thanks to everyone here and uh, I'll turn off the recording and if there's other questions, you can certainly linger. But certainly on behalf of the Canadian eLearning Network and the rest of the folks, uh, thank you very much, Jeff and Marika.